become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial, and your co-host for today. Thanks for joining us. If you're joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118-year-old nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to the, to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed are those of the speakers. The Commonwealth Club is producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So head over to commonwealthclub.org/mms for all upcoming programs, plus podcasts and videos from past programs. If you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our special guest today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thanks so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Today we're discussing sex testing, world, the World Athletics Organization, our intersex community, and the Olympics. Our guest today is the editor of As Equals, a, a, C, a, a special CNN series focused on gender inequality. Let's welcome Eliza Anyangwe. Eliza, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. Nice to meet you and lovely to meet you as well, John. So why don't we begin with the two individuals who are profiled in the series, in the special series that's focused on the Olympics and sex testing. Let's share the stories of Annette Nagesa and Maxi Molly. Absolutely. So um, just the first thing to uh, share with viewers and listeners is, of course, as the editor of the As Equal series, my role here was really in um, helping the reporters tease out um, the story, helping to make months of researching and reporting accessible, thinking about how we would structure and shape that story for a wider audience, for a CNN audience. So I really need to start by sort of, um, you know, uh, giving a shout out to Christina McFarlane, who is the uh, CNN sport correspondent who um, was talking, who spoke first to, uh, to the women we profiled, as well as Joe Shelley, who was the producer who worked alongside her tirelessly to do this work. Um, and then Ivy Nyanyeka, who is the reporter in Kenya, who we then brought on later to sort of pull the story together that um, readers will, will, will have read or can still hopefully read. Um, so the stories um, are really just, it's, it's really a story of just unfair systems. We um, introduce you to first Annette Nagesa, who is a Ugandan athlete. Um, like Max Imali, she is on a course, uh, on a trajectory for stardom, for glory. Um, let me, you know, situate, I think for a lot of athletes, um, the opportunities that come from sporting are really the only way to change uh, lives. And specifically for these two athletes, one from Uganda and one from Kenya, both East African countries, um, for these particular women, um, sports was the one way that they had of really transforming the life, not only their lives, but the lives of their families. And so they're on this trajectory and they're working hard and they're pushing their bodies. Um, and they're not really thinking very much of anything else until uh, Negesa uh, gets uh, asked to, you know, uh, participate um, in a, gets tested for testosterone levels, which was something that happened to all the athletes that were competing that year. Um, I think it was at the, um, uh, the World Championships in 2011. So like all other athletes, she hands over um, blood tests. And then that really begins a process where she um, is, you know, told that her, um, uh, her testosterone levels do not qualify for the categories and um, so disqualify her for the categories that she's going to run for and there is a little bit of confusion and I think that really that confusion comes through from uh, the athletes themselves where they say they weren't given the information that they required weren't really able to make an informed decision their manager then you know um, is advised that they should go to Nice in the south of France um, to reduce their testosterone levels, which is 
can only happen uh, through an operation. Um, and so she goes to Nice, um, uh, submits to a medical assessment, um, has an MRI scan done, has further blood tests taken, and then talks both to us and to others who have reported her story. Human Rights Watch did a very in-depth um, interview with her about waking up and realizing that um, in the internal testes that she did not know she had um, have been removed. Um, so her ability to recover from that, um, mind you, worth saying that that operation was performed in Uganda. So there's a bit of globe cris uh, cross crossing going on. She is tested in Nice and then operated on locally uh, in the capital in, Kamp uh, in Kampala in Uganda. Um, and so from there, she doesn't have access to the hormone therapies required for her to heal. Um, it essentially ruins her career. She has to um, come out, uh, pull out from the sport, but also she enters into the media spotlight um, and is exposed and, uh, as, you know, intersex. Um, uh, and there's a lot of misinformation or, you know, prejudice against that and has to eventually seek asylum in Germany. And it's in Germany where uh, Christina and Joe um, uh, interviewed her. Um, and then we tell the story also of Max in Mali, who is younger and who has a, you know, who was on the same course, um, uh, but who did not have any operations. And, and you know, from their anecdotal testimonies, you know, it was very clear that the idea of um, Max's, uh, Imali's uh, gender being questioned was really disturbing, not only for her, but for her mother, who reassures her that, um, you know, she has, she was raised a, a girl, she sees her as a girl, and so she shouldn't, um, she shouldn't undergo testing. Um, but that has really changed the categories in the sport that she is able to compete in. So they're both runners. Um, and the organization here that has been really sort of pivotal, the IWAF, which is now called World Athletics, has been has had these rules, right? And people will know maybe not of Imali and of Negesa, but of Castor Semenya, the South African athlete who has been very much in the spotlight and very vocal um, about um, her, her certainty and conviction um, that she should be competing, that the rules are unfair, um, and, and yeah, has taken uh, world athletics to court. Um, so that's the context of the story. We start with these women's, you know, testimonies of just being um, caught unawares, um, you know, having to readjust both to their sort of internal news um, um, that they hadn't ever heard before, and then the sort of questions about what their careers and futures in the sport would hold once they're suddenly told that they can no longer compete in the sport they've been training for, in the categories they've been training for. Wow, so you have them coming to terms with, with stuff they didn't know and, and how that's going to impact their careers and their lives. Um, you have professional sports of also well, am, Olympics. I'm going to call it professional sports, um, but oh, amateur and professional sports trying to come to terms with something. And then, and this you alluded to this at the beginning, where you're talking about your role is, you know, how do you pull this story together and communicate it to an audience? You have audiences with CNN, uh, presumably around the world, who are coming to terms with this or just hearing about intersex topics for the first time maybe or coming to it with 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 you know who knows what background that, that everyone brings to things um so kind of maybe going way back to the beginning it's like how do you communicate to that and and knowing that all of these different groups and 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 segments of of, of the audience and and participants are are kind of finding their way at the same time that no one seems to have a lot of information on this Absolutely. So I, that's a really great question. So I think for, for me, we had, you know, heaps and heaps of reporting and research that the producer and correspondent had gathered. Um, and then even more so when we brought on the freelance journalist to report um, the story, they were also interviewing people for the, for the written story. So from the start, we knew that we wanted to, to tell a multimedia story. We wanted for people to be able um, 
to access the story in multiple ways. And we knew that there was a lot of information we had to digest. So um, putting it all in, in written word was not going to be the way to do it. So we really had to work very closely with our visuals team to develop the interactive elements that you see, the explainer of what it means to be intersex, the um, timeline of sex testing. Um, so there were some core elements that we had to first map out. Um, and that's just in terms of the storytelling, right? There are some sort of bigger societal questions that we also had to grapple with ourselves um, to make sure that what we thought was important, the sort of key injustices um, of this uh, come across through the story, right? So CNN as equals um, tries to be slightly different from other sort of, you know, women's issue reporting teams or, or desks that cover gender because we don't just want to tell you stories. Um, I, I normally talk about stories of boom and bust. So either the 99% of women whose lives are miserable or that one woman who is now a CEO on the board somewhere, right? Those stories don't really help people to understand the underlying reasons for e why it's either surprising that one woman is successful or terrible that so many, you know, who are still earning, you know, why do women still earn 75 cents to the dollar of a man or whatever that is? So our stories, um, we want them to be uh, visually compelling. Um, we want them to be, you know, really well reported. Um, they're in depth. We don't do news like much of our colleagues at the rest of CNN do. So that all of that, that time gives us space to really sort of sit with um, where does, you know, follow the, essentially follow the, 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 the story to the underlying system. What does it help us to, to reveal? And I think here um, it was clear that the story was pointing us in the direction of um, the gendered nature of sport, right? That sport was something, um, and professional sporting competition. So whether going back, if you wanted to, when we were reading a lot about sort of like the ancient Olympics, right? Before the modern day Olympics, these are, I, you know, only men can compete and not just any men, right? So men who are, it, it's, uh, professional sports is not just about your athletic capacity, but also about your moral standing, right? And from the start, there has always been these two things together. Like, you know, the uh, original Olympians had to be men of a certain sort of societal caliber. And then there's a lot of reticence through the decades through, you know, for women to become, to be allowed into sport. The founder of the modern Olympics movement was against the inclusion of women. And that plays against the backdrop um, of that question of, you know, since sport is competitive, the geopolitics of the time, you know, maybe countries will be submitting men as women to compete. Um, and so that sense of, um, on one hand, you know, how might countries, so, you know, Russia or the U.S. try to undermine each other by submitting uh, male athletes to compete as female athletes, um, shape some of the history of sex testing, but also this really, the question of, you know, um, what women are, are in society to do, right? The misogynistic perception that we're meant to just be pretty and paint our nails and be delicate flowers. Um, and so in the story, we quote this New York Times article, um, and I can't remember if it's from the 50s or 60s, where the writer says, you know, who is going to want to marry these athletes, these Olympians, um, because, you know, they might be able to throw a short put, but, you know, if they can't, um, so th these are all my words, obviously, cook and clean, you know, who's going to want them? And so, uh, whether it's through the Olympics or other sort of sporting uh, competitions and um, the world athletics uh, events, um, it, it becomes clear that women are not just perceived as competitors in those spaces, but they represent something bigger. And so the idea of there being, you know, some kind of unfairness or that this is something that needs to be policed closely um, becomes the responsibility of these organizations, the World Athletics Federation, um, uh, uh, World Athletics or the, um, the IOC, uh, which is the uh, International Olympics Committee. And, and they see themselves as neutral arbiters who are just trying to um, you know, ensure that the sports remain fair. But of course, from the perspective of these individuals, it is massively unfair. We're going to get back to that because I have a whole lot of questions about that to see if you had uncovered additional information about, you know, who exactly gets to sit around. I'm imagining in my mind a round table uh, where they define, you know, what's too much testosterone and so on. But I did want to touch on, um, since, you know, you brought up the gender aspect of the conversation that 
there's also a racialized aspect. And if we can go in, into that and share, you know, the uh, conversation that's included in the project that we talk about um, the injustices from that point of view. Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. So one of the things that the story covers, and uh, we speak to Payoshni Mitra, who is an academic and has been for a long time um, an advocate on the side of intersex athletes. Um, and she basically speaks to what she sees as, you know, um, this unfair focus on the sporting prowess of women from the global south, right? And anecdotally, this is difficult to um, uh, to argue with, uh, especially as one of the ways in which athletes are identified as intersex when, uh, unlike Negesa, they're not all submitted to blood tests, is by you know other athletes saying they suspect them of perhaps being you know an intersex. So you somebody when you think about that context in competition where you are being outperformed by someone who is faster than you and because of the ways in which they look you then suspect that perhaps they might be you know have an unfair advantage because of their testosterone level which i must make clear um the science on this is is contested right so um there is research and evidence that shows testosterone level can can improve your performance there is also research that shows it can harm your performance or have no impact at all so there is no and you know also to be clear male athletes who are very successful so you know athletes who identify as men some of them have low testosterone levels right so we are not uh, policing the testosterone levels in men it doesn't seem to be a problem to their achievement whether they have low or high testosterone levels but for women there is a sense that this creates and it, uh, uh, some sort of unfair advantage. And here, um, to the question of it being racialized, we see that a lot of the athletes who are affected, so a very clear example for audiences is that at the last Olympics, so not the one that has just finished, but the Olympics before in um, Brazil, uh, the Rio games, uh, the top, the, 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 four, the three athletes who medaled in the 400 meters race, were all disqualified because of testosterone levels in in that in, in the sense that when we now come to uh, to Tokyo, none of them are competing in that same race, right? Um, that is a very real, very immediate impact on the games. Um, and all three of those athletes were women from the global south, right? All three of those were women of color. Um, and so the, the, the sense that uh, this, uh, you know, uh, unfairly affects women from the global south is, is difficult to contest. Now, one of the things that we also found, you know, um, we, uh, for the sake, not of balance, but of just sort of creating a more complex issue, I'm sorry, a much more complex picture, is that um, perhaps some of the reasons why it is mostly athletes from the global south who are coming to discover that they're intersex and not all of them identify as intersex, not all of them have come out to say they're intersex, but let's so let's say who have levels of testosterone that disqualify them from, from certain categories of competition um, is because there was a practice in the States in the 1950s to um, uh, give what they were, was called corrective surgery. Now, I, maybe you will see my screen is being frozen, so you can't see my sort of heavy quote marks there as I've got some air quote marks going, um, but these were considered, you know, corrective surgery. So the practice um, in, in science and for families was if you, were, if you had a child who had uh, both sex organs um, and maybe sort of let's, so let's say, you know, a vulva, but also internal testes, um, there was a lot of pressure to choose the, your child's gender um, at, at birth and so to perform an operation on that child and then to raise them and socialize them because we know that gender is a social construct to socialize them as one gender or the other right so uh, some of the people we spoke to say well there are fewer athletes who are competing now as intersex from the global north because this practice that was very prominent in the states and elsewhere um, has meant that if you're a certain age you know you would have been socialized as female or male right so um, you're, if you had internal testes, for example, they would have been removed. So your testosterone levels are not going to be a problem. 
as that is being challenged now, um, and you know, uh, academic communities, um, uh, pediatric com care communities, and parents and intersex people themselves are saying that this is not an illness. It's not like I have a tumor that needs to be operated on, and that gender is socially constructed, so I can choose how to socially construct my gender. As those conversations are beginning to be had, and fewer operations are happening, fewer corrective surgeries are happening, perhaps in a few Olympics time, we might find that actually um, there are also athletes from the global north who are testing, um, you know, whose, whose testosterone levels might be uh, in, you know, might, might break world athletics rules or the IOC's rules. But also if we're to be hopeful, maybe in a few, in a, in a few uh, Olympics time, those um, governing organizations, those sporting bodies might change their rules in such a way that whether someone might have um, high testosterone level or not, might not immediately preclude them from, from competition. Um, this may be, this obviously is taking it beyond the scope of, of this project, but what about, for example, high school sports and college and, and other sporting uh, uh, you know, areas, um, are these, these issues must be being tackled there one way or another. And if so, do we know, is there a trend as to, you know, accepting this as a third definition or just putting, you know, kind of forcing it into a category? I mean, what do we see elsewhere besides the Olympics? Yeah, I, this is a great question. I think that on social, you know, because uh, gender is socially constructed, various societies and communities are in different places on that conversation, right? So, um, you know, one of the things uh, that is, was apparent, for example, in Negesa's case, um, is that, you know, there is a lot of uh, stigma and prejudice against intersex athletes in the same way as there is against just, you know, the LGBT community. And, um, and those things are associated, even though, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with necessarily how the individual might identify or what they might say of themselves. So we know that those conversations are in different places. We know that New Zealand, for example, this year, you know, had an athlete, uh, a, a trans woman compete. We also know that uh, being trans is different to being intersex, right? Uh, but these are also sort of topics that are swimming in the same waters um, and in the US you know particularly with like you know um, as you've mentioned high school and sporting competitions there is a very sort of pressurized pressure cooker conversation happening there which you know we have to acknowledge because um, culturally America still very much conversations in the state still very much shape at least media conversations elsewhere, if not people's lived realities, right? America, we still very much have a cultural hegemony um, where the rest of us are consuming American media and consuming American ideas and American cult, you know, cultural discourses. Um, but in a, on a practical level, you know, for athletes like Negesa and Imali, um, this is just a basic question of understanding of the issues. What does it mean to be intersex? What are my rights as an intersex person in a context where also my rights as a woman might be challenged, my opportunities as a woman might be limited? Um, uh, you know, how do I advocate for myself and how do other people advocate for me as well? Um, and, and that is, you know, that is the sort of the wider question, right? They, these issues must be centered within conversations about just sort of gender equality more broadly and not sort of siphon off in a section because as you know, intersex and in sports, because people don't tend to understand that and or can dismiss it. I don't care about athletics or I don't really get what it means to be intersex, but as essentially, it's about fairness and for people to be able to turn up as they are and participate fully in life. What's the media's role in all of this? You just brought up the media and, um, you know, the narratives we push. It would appear that the media is obsessed with the binary. And that's the way that we've been telling these stories. And so, um, you know, the, what's the media's role in, in this and what can the media do in the future? So I think um, I think this is one of those things, like with race, uh, quite frankly, like with the like with the class struggle, like with any of the sort of systemic issues that we cover, um, uh, and that the notion of objectivity somehow remains separate from. We are all people living in this in on this you know blue dot too, right? And we are all uh, socialized within the various contexts where we are. Now, before I moved to the Netherlands, where I now currently live. I started and you know spent all of my career uh, the past decade in journalism in the UK, where 
the vast majority by a ridiculously high percentage um, of editors in the biggest newsrooms, in the biggest media organizations, um, are all white dudes who went to Oxbridge, right? And the reason that's important is that their worldview and the things that they determine as important is what shapes you know, what's the, the, the media landscape, right? So I definitely believe that the media cannot tell you what to think, but it can tell you what to think about. So the things that we cover over and over and over and over again, shapes people's perception of the world that they live in, shapes people's perception of themselves and of their agency to change things. So I definitely think that uh, one thing concretely that, you know, people who have um, power in media, so who are right, well, not so much writers, because we know editors can crush any, any bold freelancers dreams to tell a different story, you just need an editor who doesn't see it as important, and that's gone. And especially as many of our, as our industry is struggling. And so many more journalists are working as freelancers, they're just going to be trying to crack out the stories where they can get paid, right? So I really am not going to put any pressure on them. I'm going to put pressure on the people who hold the keys and the gatekeepers and who hold the budgets. Um, and those are editors um, and newsroom leaders. So I think what one thing we can do is to, you know, turn the lens and, uh, tell stories from a different perspective, have a bottom up view, think about who is telling the story because the person who's telling the story, their perspective shapes what is the story, right? Um, and so we cannot anymore presume that um, we are neutral and disconnected from the societies around us. We are part of them and we need to figure out how we acknowledge the limitations of our own knowledge and our own socialization. And so, and, and, and work more collaboratively. And actually from a US perspective, there's so many inspiring examples of collaborative journalism. For us as, as, as equals who are trying to do this within the behemoth that is CNN, we have a different challenge on our hands, but we're trying to work much more collaboratively in terms of storytelling, which is why Ivy Nyaneka the uh, Kenyan freelancer was brought on board so that we weren't flying in a reporter to do a couple of interviews um, and miss some of the new ones perhaps that might come from being a part of a community and reporting from that community. So that's one thing we can definitely do. Another thing that I think about all the time, even though it often sounds so boring because my God, if it bleeds, it leads. You know, we love, we love a dreadful story um, is how do we report on solutions? How can we still be um, dogged and trying to like expose things or figure out how things work and not just kind of like how they fall apart, right? Um, and the last area is perhaps a bit more um, uh, less defined. I'm thinking constantly about um, future gazing. Um, the stories we tell today clearly shape our perception of the world that we're in now, but also then shapes the actions we take for the world that we're going to be in tomorrow. So I think about this a lot with gender reporting, with, um, but also with climate reporting, for example. So where there's a lot more sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's a word that comes from sci-fi and has now completely escaped my mind. Um, there's a, 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 a type of, essentially it's like, not forecasting, Anyway, if it comes back, I will remind you. Um, I will come back to it. But there's a type of um, speculative, that's the word, um, and not in the sort of market sense, because speculative in banks, bad, but speculative in journalism, perhaps good, um, because well, how do we try and speculate on what the future could be in a way that is evidence-based and researched and well thought through, um, but that allows people to perhaps cast their eye a bit more into a future that isn't so dystopian, right? Because I think that if you just read our stories day on day, if you just read the news day on day, you think like, bleep, bleep, we're going, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. And perhaps that's not true because there are lots of people and organizations um, that are working to, to, to ensure alternative outcomes. So can we center those as much as we center the negative stories? At least as, as an editor, these are the questions that I sit with without then, you know, um, doing someone else's job. Um, how do I do that from my vantage point as a journalist um, and not as an activist or a politician or whatever else? That's a, a great explanation, I think, of, of what you're trying to do there at, at As Equals. Can you go a bit more into As Equals? As, is, how did it come about? How did you get involved with it? And um, where can people find more about it? 
Yes. So as Equals was launched in 2018, this is when I'm going to get a message from my bosses to say it was a different year. But anyway, I invite you all to fact check me. Um, so as Equals was launched in 2018 uh, with a grant um, from the European Journalism Centre, um, and it was a, a project uh, started by uh, my bosses um, in London. So out of the CNN International Bureau in London um, to focus on gender inequality. And this was a project that they were very much it was very much a shoestring budget they were doing it alongside other things which very much reflects the ways in which our earlier stories um a lot of them award-winning hard-hitting journalism but much more related to sort of the news agenda um uh, because you know the reporters who were working on it were also working on news stories etc um they we then got last year uh, a, a grant for over a three year period from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which kicked in January of this year um, to build out a, a desk, uh, which is a rare beast at CNN. Right. A lot of our reporters and producers are sort of generalists who work on whatever the sort of day's news is. So we are in an extraordinarily privileged position as as equals to be a team that has a beat to not have to sort of, um, rip, you know, sort of um, chase every news story. Um, I often say to my team, if it is immediately apparent that it, there's a gender angle there um, to other reporters. So for example, what's happening in Afghanistan, everybody is wondering what is going to be the, uh, the what's happening to women and girls in that context. We don't immediately have a role to play there because everybody is already aware that there is a gendered part to that story. What we are now seeking to do is to find out, OK, well, are we centering just Western voices? You know, the kind of uh, Western fear. We, there's so much of the, of the media is focused on, you know, the, the idea of what women's clothing is going to be right, that the ultimate oppression for Afghan women is going to be to be veiled. Um, because look at them in the 70s when they were wearing mini skirts. And we, you know, that kind of that dissonance that we sometimes have where we realize that we can wear dis, uh, mini skirts here in the global north and or, you know, in the US and still, um, you know, uh, policymakers are going to legislate over your ovaries. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of uh, distance, you know, we try and challenge some of that to kind of paint a global picture of a, of a system that persists. Um, and so, yeah, as Equals Now is a team of six people across the world. I have a reporter in India and in Nigeria, uh, a video producer who's just leaving us from Seattle. Um, and we are going to tell stories in written word, in video, hopefully do more audio. I see us as the innovation lab of CNN in some ways. And then we just happen to be focusing on gender stories, right? We're trying to see if we can train an audience on a diet of more considered you know, long form, slowly reported stories. Um, I borrow this from an old boss of mine who says, you know, a lot of news is about telling you what the weather is and our job is to tell you about the climate. And that's our the role that we have at Anders Equals as well. We don't wanna just give you a kind of weather report for the day. We wanna give you a sense, a step back view so that you have an understanding of the climate because that meaning is important. We're deluged in, in information, but not enough sort of meaning making. And we're gonna try and play our part to do that when it comes to stories about gender inequality. What's been, I guess, um, you know, shocking, if you've uncovered shocking information that you didn't know before while uh, doing this project, I'll say, you know, the one story that we got the honor to get to know, which is sex testing. Um, what was shocking to me was this athletics organization or, or this group of people and, it, to me, at least, my opinion, in some ways, playing God and defining, you know, who, what's, uh, who's a woman, who's a man, and the amount of testosterone that would define who's a woman and a man, and then being behind the scenes um, in, I guess, convincing or pushing people to go have these medical procedures that, in, again, my opinion, is a human rights violation. Yeah, I, you know, I often think and I, I can't um, this, I, I, I can't say that about world athletics, but when I hear you talk, I often think about sort of like the banality of evil, right, that expression, because what, what is most shocking to me is how 
these systems of oppression, these systems of exclusion um, exist, are maintained and perpetrated without anybody even having any, you know, any real sense of them of malicious intent, right? We spoke to the lawyer from World Athletics who defends, who explains their actions as being, you know, benevolent and, you know, almost helping people to um, identify what that, that they're intersex and then do something about them as though it's an act that is empowering, right? But as you've said, even though they do not pressure people into surgeries um, in their own, to say that actually you can no longer compete in ex and you know in in these um, in these uh, categories does shape the, the the choices that people have right so you might not say in order to compete you should do X Y Z but to say you can no longer compete unless you do X Y Z still shapes people's lives, right? And we did for a minute sort of, you know, sit and look, wanted to understand who is making the decisions. You know, it would be so easy and wonderful if we just had a picture of, you know, 70 old white guys and we're like, look, and then we were able to contrast it with Negesa and Imali, but it's not that simple, right? Um, and and these systems and are upheld and maintained, you know, also by women who are like, actually sports needs to be fair. Yes, we need to test. Yes, it's un it seems unfair to these individuals, but better for the greater good. It is important that, at least for me, wherever the reader or listener comes to at the end of the story where they can make their own conclusions, but that there was a dominant, uh, that for me, I was, I often think because our stories are, are long and in depth and about systemic issues, not what is the changed perspective that you can walk away from? Like, I'm not gonna change your mind in a story. Um, in fact, maybe the issue is so, so complicated that one story um, cannot sort of crack it open with an easy solution, right? We're not Google answers. Um, However, can I leave you with an over with a with a clear emotion, with a clear feeling? And if you come away from the story thinking, I don't know how sport should be organized, but shit, it is very unfair how it currently is. Great. Then there's someone else who's activated to think about like what does gender actually what purpose does gender serve, right? And what purpose does gender serve in sport? And if we can start to question these things, then maybe we end up in a better system than one that we currently have. The worst outcome for me is if we go through lives, not our lives, not really questioning um, both the labels that we wear individually, but the labels that particularly are put on other people and who those people don't have access to platforms and voice. Um, so, you know, my job is to cast a spotlight on these people and communities who are wearing labels that we don't seem to question, right? And, and I think about the power of words like this all the time, right? What, what does it mean when you call someone illegal? What does it mean when you call someone, you know, um, uh, intersex or they have too much, you know, all, all these labels um, and then how we build systems around those people. And some people have easy access and the straightest path and others, you know, um, have to go around the houses. Um, just by exposing that, hopefully we can start to interrogate it, interrogate our place in it, and maybe challenge it. And what is happening within the Olympics uh, in infrastructure, the decision makers and the people who kind of either support or make these rules? Is there kind of a, a change going on there, or is it pretty solid that, no, we're, we think we're doing the right thing? I think the latter, unfortunately, at the moment. So we will wait for to see the judgment um, in uh, Casa Semenya's latest appeal. So we don't yet know what that is. And our colleagues in sports, uh, as well as my team, will be following it to see what happens. Um, the Olympics um, showed that some of the athletes who were, you know, who were told they could not compete in certain categories have gone on to excel in others. Does that sort of give uh, the IOC or World Athletics course to, you know, dig their heels in and say, look, you see, it doesn't end careers. Um, you can just kind of reorient. Or does it, you know, uh, put other categories under the spotlight now and people get really frightened that intersex athletes or athletes with high, with high testosterone levels are going to now dominate in other categories. So do we see the rules changing to exclude them there too? Um, it's a wait and see. And I think the, the, the uh, Olympics of this year were really overshadowed, of course, by um, COVID and, and having Olympics under, you know, in, in a heightened sense, sense of like uh, 
um, uncertainty and tension with the pandemic, right? Um, the Japanese population was deeply uh, displeased with that. And so it was very difficult for there to be any other lines that, you know, were really drawn out. Um, and, you know, I think to, I think to the question Michelle asked me before about what has shocked me, I think that sense of these, um, the things that happen to women and non-binary people being considered so normal like uh, that at best we will have a headline there might be a brief mention in reporting and not the kind of sustained wtf that we would <laughs> we need over a, an extended period of time like how normal it is to go oh yeah okay texas has now said you know it's basically outlawed uh, abortions oh okay today's headline let's move on right um how how normal it is for an organization that is unelected, not representative of anybody to be deciding who can be, for the sake of sports or the, for the sake of athletics, be considered uh, a, a woman or not, right? Because there are only two categories. It's male or female. And this unelected body is making the, the, that call um, that affects people's lives. And we can, you know, there's a kind of bookmark, we can bookmark it in our minds and kind of move on. And I think that this, the levels of, yeah, just gender inequality are so normalized. That's what's most shocking to me. It's kind of like, how do I break through that? Because we just accept it. Would love to hear more about some future stories that you might be working on or that's coming up. Yeah, so um, in order to help us focus, um, because three years is a very short period of time, year one is almost up, I'm going gray just thinking about it. Um, uh, so we need to think about what we can achieve in the time that we have left. So as equals is going to focus on three big bucket areas. Um, the first is body. So all things that are related to the body really. And I think that question of who owns women's bodies, right? Um, is a really, really important, really topical, really relevant because so much else um, um, stems from that. Um, and so the body care and the sort of the care economy and the fact that women, and we saw this with COVID, women still continue to bear the brunt of um, the care burden. Um, uh, so that the questions of care uh, and how that's prioritized in society remains really important. And the last one is climate, right? Climate is not just an environmental phenomenon, it's a social one and it is a, it, there are clear gendered elements. So we want to, over the course of the three years, report on that. In the immediate future, we've got stories coming up. We are launching a series focusing on skin whitening because from uh, Minnesota to Malawi, um, Japan to India, um, a, a narrative that says lighter skin is better um, uh, means women are, are using products that are often illegal, mercury-based, hydroquinone-based products to lighten their skin. Um, and the focus is often in the media on these women as kind of like, you know, either how silly this sort of odd cultural thing that you do um, and not often sustained on the companies that make a, a, a very good buck from these um, from these from selling these products. The Black Lives Matter movement of last year, the sort of focus on that last year brought into sharp relief um, these companies that were saying Black Lives Matter and yet we're selling in India or in Nigeria um, products that uh, basically is ad ad advertised as sort of fairer is better. And so we are going to, over a sustained period of time, you know, cast our spotlight on the business side of this, the um, health implications of skin lightening and the social um, costs um, uh, of, of skin uh, whitening. Um, so that's where, um, th those are some of the stories we're going to be telling um, in, in the coming months. But yeah, climate um, with the COP26 conference around the corner as well. So we have a mandate to do just about one story a month. So it's hard to pick uh, what we're going to put all our energy and focus into. Um, but with skin whitening, we really saw that it really connected various parts of the world um, and was just one that we could have clear impact if we said, you know, hey, we need governments of the world to ban the use of mercury in skincare products. That is something that where our journalism can see can lead to very clear change in the world. And it's not often that you and the privileged position where you can advocate for something that clearly. So uh, we're going to go after it and see what happens. In, in your position where you do get to explore these issues and bring them up in, in, in front of millions of people, 
you have to have, I guess, a certain inborn optimism that, like you just said, that this this matters that you you raise this. Um, are you optimistic generally about a lot of these big issues? I mean, it seems the climate, you know, has gotten worse. It seems, you know, uh, that with this huge global populist uprising, you know, that that a lot of issues on gender and and other things have backslid, if you will. Certainly, yeah. obviously, from one point of view. Um, what's your general take on things? Oh, John, I'm, I have a tendency towards despair, unfortunately, as a person. Um, but I, you know, I read Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks and Rebecca Solnit, who often talks about radical hope. Um, and, you know, I was born in Cameroon. And so uh, there's a, 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 a culture still, if it, you know, survives kind of um, uh, Western globalization of valuing your ancestors and and that having and the, the the reason I mentioned that is that it gives you a long tail like you if you see things over longer periods of time um, you have reason to be hopeful right um, if you look at just our moment now so if you if you are watching the weather reports then you know you're like we're screwed but actually if you try and step back and see the evolution of things over time, um, then there have been gains and that there's possibility to continue to have gains. And I do think it's actually, a, it's a thing of privilege to despair, right? People who are living with very little do not have the time um, and energy, you know, to despair. Like the woman who is unable to return to full-time work because she's had a baby and has to figure out some kind of part-time work situation. She does not have the privilege of kind of just despairing about the state of sort of gender inequality. So, uh, I try and remind myself of that, that if you take that step back view, things have improved. And then I just try and also, even in my team, run my team in a way that allows for us to um, talk about how we're feeling about the stories that we're covering, because there is not enough space for journalists to, to, to talk about the sort of mental health impact of the work that we do. And I think over the pandemic year, it is clear that journalists are burnt out. Some even have PTSD. You know, we can't just in and out report, you know, terrible things and not have those things impact us. So I'm privileged that in my team, I can create that space for us to talk about um, not just how we're feeling, but how do we respond to that in the work that we do? And so to be able to center the whole person, um, it is from that, that distance that I have from sort of the news agenda that allows me to do that, right? Like if I had to be cracking out a hundred stories a day or whatever it was, um, we would not be in the position to do that. So I think, um, yeah, that allows me to remain hopeful. Um, I think it's absolutely important and critical that we remain hopeful. And I think the other way to remain hopeful if anyone is looking for tips is just shift your gaze right um so for example on climate a lot of the sort of uh, ideas and solutions that we're now focusing on whether it's small scale agriculture or intercropping or um you know uh, the importance of land management or even recognizing that trees are not just kind of like factors of production this tree could be a chair so i'd rather have it as a chair those approaches to nature like and like uh, indigenous communities right have championed and focused on for a long time so if we have lost our way um then we can't you know presume while we're trying to figure find it and figure it out their communities if we just shift our gaze and say hey what is the indigenous approach to this what is in in places like in west africa where we're talking about uh, gender inequality often and um, uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, again, if we shift our gaze and recognize that actually, you know, some communities had plural gender identities, had different uh, pre sort of um, colonialism, had different ways of structuring society, then maybe we don't need so much to invent something new, but just to return to something past, right, that was devalued. And I try and remain a, a student of history, maybe, so that I can I can recognize that there are various timelines um, happening, and so uh, we're not stuck on this particular course, um, and we can pivot, and that there are other people who are living in different ways, and and I can shift to look at them and take inspiration from that. Sometimes I write down questions that I don't intend to ask, but <laughs> because I think they they might be too hard to answer, um, but I'll go ahead and ask this because I think you're. <laughs> the right person to ask, but the question I wrote down is, I mean, what would happen if, you know, women actually 
uh, had control and power over their bodies or that LGBTQIA plus people were centered and prioritized and since systems were created with them in, in mind. That's essentially the question of speculative journalism, right? Like, what if we won? Like, what would that look like? What would the course from there be? And I love that question. I don't know. So I think that human beings, for the sake of their safety, have a tendency to label and form groups, right? So I don't for one second think that if you put people with vulvas in charge of everything, that all the world's problems will stop. Um, I don't think so. I also think, however, that because we have socialized uh, women, for example, to be more, um, to talk about their feelings, to think through problems, to be, pro they actually have a, a skill set that, and this is, you know, general, broad generalizations that have helped them in positions of leadership. So there were countless articles at the height of the pandemic about why countries run by women were dealing so much better with it than countries who were, you know, and that's because you just need to look at any guy's reaction to having the man flu and, <laughs> and, and how the world must stop. Um, and, you know, and, and so those sort of ways in which we are, the, society is gendered and we, we raise boys and girls differently um, um, might provide some clues. Now, what that might mean is that we should probably raise boys to be equally as sensitive and raise girls to know that they can break things too and, you know, um, and, and try things and be innovative and et cetera. Um, I love that question because I want more people to answer it because I also hope that there will be plural answers. Like what we are learning from this, like from our, our monoculture in all kinds of ways is that monoculture doesn't work. It makes us less resilient, right? That's why diversity is great. It's not just about ticking off people in a group. It's saying actually the, the, the diversity of our experiences and our ideas um, it gives us resilience is what makes us strong. And like, we, we also have to learn that from nature, right? You put, a field of just corn together, a pest comes and the whole thing's gone. You grow different things together. The crop is more resilient. Like people just need to learn from nature in that regard. And so I love that we can ask this question and that the more newsrooms are asking it and not seeing it as fluffy or um, outside the scope of our work, even if it doesn't have an immediate impact on our work. Like we're, we, we know what our role is as journalists. I think that asking these questions um, might help us redefine what that role is as we're kind of having an existential crisis, right? Like if everybody who has a phone is a journalist, what does that, where does that leave me? And like, you know, actually there's still a, a role for the for people who can pull all these threads of information together, ask the big questions, are kind of tenacious and curious and dogged in their search for answers. The guy with the phone who records the fire, he doesn't need to explain to anybody why it happened or come back the next week to see if anything has changed because of it. There is still a role for us in doing so. Um, and so, yeah, the more answers to that question, the better. What, what would yours be, Michelle? I'm going to throw it right back at you. Uh, yeah, thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, the, the initial answer would be like, I don't know. I've never been taught or given the opportunity to imagine that, right? Like I, I live in a world and live in a society in which um, fighting the oppression is my existence. And so if it were to actually happen, I think it would be magical um, in, in a lot of ways. And I think that there would be less hurt and pain and trauma. And that's as far as I can answer it. Back to you, John. <laughs> yes, I wanna hear John's thoughts. Well, the, the, this, the... Sorry, I have, a, I have a window open. I'm afraid loud cars just went by. This is a different way of getting to the same thing. And that is just, there are questions I don't ask necessarily because I think the answer is depressing. And that is a lot of what you're just talking about is stuff that, that was common coinage, common currency, if you will, of, of conversations and political movements when I was in grade school in the 1970s. You know, you're who you are, regardless of what you're, you're you know, boy or girl or whatever. And, and you know, you, you try to be what you can. And, and even on, on the same thing on the racial side of, of you know, trying to overcome long-term things. And it's like after the 1970s, we went through at least four decades of pretty severe reaction to that. I'm, I'm obviously talking to the United States, but it, it may be mirrored elsewhere as well. So um, 
okay, so now if we're asking some of these same questions and some people are still feeling, you know, the, the same pressures and, and problems are, are there, um, are we in a better space? Because at least four decades later, you know, Angela Merkel is stepping down after 16 years as a very popular leader of Germany, arguably of the West. You know, we've had a number of other female leaders we, we still do in places like New Zealand and elsewhere. Or should I be depressed because <laughs> four decades later, we're still talking about the same thing and it's still a, an initial problem for a lot of people to just get beyond. So I'm throwing it yes to both and. of you. Yeah, well, yeah, go for it. Have a yes and view, right? There are days when I'm sure in your own part of the world and in the things that matter to you, um, it's all doom and gloom and despair and whatever you need to do to pick yourself up. Like that's why community is so important, right? Whoever helps you do that, more power to them. And, and you know, that, that support network is, is invaluable for that. Despair on the on the micro, but hope on the macro, right? So I would I have a kind of yes and view, um, and we should, right? Because these things are not mutually exclusive; they're no binaries. So uh, why treat this as one? Um, it can be both bad and good. It can be getting worse and better. Um, and and yeah, we need to just keep pri prizing open that space um, because I think oftentimes the, for the people for whom it is good. Um, there's someone else, as I've said, who is out of view and presumably voiceless for whom it is very bad. Um, and so we just need to be making it possible for more people to exist in that space. And I think the ways in which we tell stories that really shifts away from the dominant narrative of the 80s and 90s and that kind of like hyper kind of market capitalism mode where everything in our lives becomes construed as, you know, a give or take, you know, um, there is a limited pie. And if some I'm doing well, someone else is doing badly, et cetera. If we, how do we shift those narratives, right? So that actually the perception that we have of including someone else and their voice doesn't have to sort of diminish my voice in any way, right? Giving rights to LGBTQI teens or trans teens and including them, you know, I use gay marriage as an example of this, uh, changing the rules on that and making it possible for queer couples to get married has also given me a heterosexual person more options when I'm trying to decide how to sort of formalize my commitment with my partner, right? Before they won those rights, I didn't have access to those privileges either. So I've, that victory is a victory for all of us. And I think that we have to be mindful as we report on these things to understand how it, imp it impacts upon people's sense of their agency and their fear of their place in the world. Because fear is normal. We just have to kind of help put that fear in a wider context. It's been a very powerful hour already and we are so appreciative of your words and your work, Eliza. Uh, my very last question is about, um, about you and your self-care and you know, taking care of yourself. You'd mentioned it earlier, uh, lots of journalists, lots of reporters, people in the media are suffering from PTSD. And I take that very seriously. And so we'd love to hear from you in um, how you handle that aspect of the job and how you take care of yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, somebody who uh, feels very deeply sort of the unfairness of our world, right? Um, I'm, I'll tell you a quick anecdote. My grandmother as a school teacher, she was a headmistress and she her retirement party in Cameroon um, had everybody come together and there's always a buffet because we love to eat. And uh, I was three at the time apparently, so the story goes and the compare calls out and says, okay, we will have, you know, we always serve the dignitaries first and the elders, whoever comes up, and apparently three-year-old Eliza says, that's not fair. Children eat less. Why don't we, why don't you start with us? And to which nobody clapped for me. It was kind of like, whose child is this? Um, and that has stayed, right? That kind of like grumbling about how unfair things are, which is why to John's question, I, I, it's true. I do have a tendency to despair. And so recognizing that I am trying to uh, understand my place in the cosmos as being very small and if all I did today was smile and acknowledge and recognize someone else's humanity and withhold my anger and that message on Slack, since we're all working remotely, that can seem a bit shorter than it was and take a second breath and have a coffee on my balcony and, you know, all those small things that I can do 
um, is probably the, going to be the sphere of my influence. If it's any bigger than that, then that's a bonus. But if today, you know, I just um, refuse to see someone else as just a consumer or just a facilitator of my needs and actually acknowledge them as another person with whom I'm sharing space and time, as I'm doing now with you, then maybe I've won for today. And I'm trying to become, I'm trying to make that okay as a kind of like highly strung overachiever who wants to fix the world. Um, maybe I just have to, maybe that's all, you know, the fixing that's gonna happen today. And I'm, I'm trying to be okay with that. John, do you have a last question before we end the program? Well, the, this kind of is touching on what you kind of just went into Eliza, which is I've been wondering about uh, cause we, in fact, we've asked a lot of the folks, uh, over the past couple of years, how they've done their job, how they've not done their job, you know, during a pandemic, um, what they can do remotely. And, you know, yes, you have the benefit of stopping and taking a break on your balcony, but, um, specifically for journalism, um, you know, do you, you know, and you said you've got, you know, reporters in, in Nigeria and, and Seattle, et cetera, or folks all around the world. Mm -hmm. Do you communicate as well with them over Zoom and on the phone as you would in, in a newsroom? Um, and what about uh, communicating, you know, like doing interviews with uh, your interview subject? Obviously, we love to be on stage with someone and see them right there. At the same time, you know, boy, we, have we had access to people we would never have had before right. because they weren't coming to San Francisco. So maybe briefly your thoughts on, on so the Zoom you... world. If you want to invite me to San Francisco, don't I, let me not dissuade you from doing so. <laughs> like, let, let's not have this conversation. And you can assume that, you know, that invitation to San Francisco is not welcome. I, I'll come to San Francisco. That aside, um, yeah, it, it has been yes and, right? It's yes, it's been great. And it's been really challenging. Like my team was always going to be distributed. And for me, that's something I've long, I've thought about for a long time because I've worked in distributed teams since 2016. Um, and so the practices, and for a year I worked with an activist collective. So a lot of the kind of woo-woo practices um, that they, they brought to spaces and how they held space together, I have brought with me into journalism, which is often at times met with um, a, a certain amount of cynicism till the pandemic, uh, because we then realized that, oh, it's important to check in with people. How are they doing? And use li little tools. We use um, something called Rosebud Thorn as a way to just talk about um, ourselves and our day or whatever. So uh, your rose is something that you're pleased with. Your bud is something that's blossoming for you and your thorn. And it can be personal or professional. And um, you know, that those are not typical in our industry, um, but I borrowed them from the kind of activism communities because um, they're just much better at seeing the person as a whole person. And I run a distributed team and I didn't want my reporters or my for to feel like they were um, disconnected from the whole, that they just needed to file their stories. I wanted them to feel aboard the as equal ship and we're all of us sailing in the same direction. And so that's creating that sense of team and community with each other is important. So that's how we do it together. But also, um, you know, I also say that everybody's mental and physical well-being is their own responsibility. So, um, you know, I remind my team that while I see everybody or we try to see each other as whole people, this is still a job. And so I, I talk about that perhaps in ways that might be discouraged, right? Like if this job is not serving you and your needs and your mental and physical health, um, you need to see, you know, you need to revolve out of it. Like you, like, um, um, you, you know, that, that sense that your job must provide your, your entire complete satisfaction and, and no, please nurture friendships outside of work, nurture hobbies, take up knitting, whatever it is that you need to do that gives you something outside of, of our time together as we work together um, is going to be invaluable to sort of balancing you out. And it's very difficult to do, you know, um, especially because to say to someone, oh, I'm an editor at CNN, you know, the kind of, it, it's good for the ego, but I have to be more than an editor at CNN to, to kind of survive this world, right? I wanna thank our speaker, Eliza Anyangwe and uh, CNN and the project that you're all working on as equals a gender inequality project. And so make sure you support their work and go and check it out. I, I promise you, uh, my opinion, <laughs> you're going to learn something if anything. And by learning something that always can create opportunities for change. 
and also thank all of you for joining us for this special program. Back to you, John. I'll just wrap it up by again thanking our guest and all of you for joining us on this Michelle Miao show at the Commonwealth Club of California. Thanks to all of you watching or listening, and you can find more programs, both upcoming and video and audio of past programs at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Stay safe and have a good weekend, or excuse me, a good week. Bye.